Thank you very much indeed, and for leaving a brief moment of time as well, because I have to go and catch a plane, so this won't be a very long um, <laughs> summing up. Uh, just one comment, um, Helen, in relation to what you showed about twin studies, uh, that I always feel one needs a certain caution. Uh, twin studies essentially control out a lot of the interesting environment. Um, for example, twin studies show that obesity is 60 to 80% heritable. And we know what's happened to obesity over time. Uh, we didn't change heritability, but it's increasing, it's epidemic. So twin studies answer a certain type of question. And as you then made clear in the rest of your talk about the importance of a particular aspect of the environment, which, given today's meeting, is adverse child experiences. I was asked when I met um, the CMO, Carol Caldwood, uh, how are we doing in Scotland? <laughs> and my first comment was the fact that this meeting is happening is really very encouraging. The fact that it's happening and was full. Uh, there was a waiting list. So many people wanted to come. So that's really encouraging. It's on the agenda. People are concerned about it. My own view is that if we think that cross-government action is vital to take action on social determinants of health and health equity, then children is a good way in. I was giving a lecture to the American Public Health Association meeting three years ago in Boston. 7,000 people in the room. And I showed figures for poverty of children before and after taxes and transfers. And a slightly different figure to the one I showed then, but I've used this contrast, if you compare the US, and I chose Australia, because I thought Australia sounds a bit like Texas, maybe California, you know, Americans would understand that. And if you compare child poverty, less than 50% median income, in the US, before and after taxes and transfers, it, child poverty goes from 24% less than 50% median income, to 23% after taxes and benefits. In Australia, it goes from 29% child poverty to 11%. And I said to this audience, it shows that government action can make a difference. And this must be the level of child poverty that you want. You live in a democracy. And you must have voted to have this. I think I'd get lynched in certain <laughs> circles now, given what happened on November the 9th. Um, the idea that this is the kind of democracy that the US wants. But it illustrates that, firstly, what kind of society we live in is important, and the social action to change the environment in which children are raised, child poverty absolutely key. And it relates to the question commonly that gets asked, well, aren't the poor to blame for their own poor health? Too many fish and chips, lack of interest in their health, don't go and see the doctor when they need to, and so on. And I have several responses to that, but one of them is, don't blame the children. It's not the children's fault for the parents they chose. You may say, I'm not enough of a biblical scholar to know, but I think it comes from Jeremiah, if the parents eat sour grapes, the children's teeth get put on edge. 
You could say, well, it's the parents' fault for eating sour grapes that the children's teeth are on edge. Yeah, but golly, you're going to blame the children for their choice of parents? So that seems to be immoral. You can't say, well, the children just should have been brought up in different families. We really, as a society, should care about those things. A second response to, isn't it their own fault? The most recent example was a study in science that was published last week, looking at rhesus macaque monkeys, female rhesus monkeys, where they can manipulate their social status. We don't do it that way. <laughs> we tend to have life course, life course effects that continue. But with rhesus, you get a group of high status monkeys and second ranking and third ranking and fourth ranking and in different groups. So you get high status from all the different groups. And then the status is highly correlated with the order in which they enter the new group. So you take Abigail and she's high status and you put her in a new group and then you take Bertha who was high status and put her in the new group. She Turn, tends to be second in the rank, and so on. You take Cordelia and put her in, and she tends to be third, and you take Demosthenes or somebody, I, I can't make it up quickly enough as you go along, and she tends to be fourth, and so on. So you can manipulate the status. Well, the monkey's immune function is determined not by the status which they had in the past, but the status in the new group. And they weren't responsible. It was their social situation that actually determined their biological response. And none of them smokes <laughs> or, or eats deep fried marba, marba, or whatever the thing is. Um, they never, don't do any of that stuff. It's related to their social position, which has been manipulated. So simply to blame people for their own misfortune or blame the children is hugely inappropriate. And if we're successful in getting cross-government buy-in because education, the criminal justice system, social welfare, environment, housing, as well as health are all key, then perhaps we've established the principle of cross-government action that would apply to the other key domains of life. Again, one of the usual questions is, yeah, 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 but politicians only think about the next election or the one after or whatever, and they're very short-term, etc. and you're talking about a long legacy. How do you get them interested in this? I have an unusual hypothesis which is inside most politicians is a desire to do good. I think inside most of us is a desire to do good. And we have to tap into that inner good person, that they're in a position to do a whole power of good. And we need to tap into that part of them that wants to do that. And I think most of them are there for that reason. They, other ghastly things happen when they get there, but most of them really are motivated at some part of their inner being. They want to do good. And then, of course, we can get short-term markers um, that show how things are going. So I think using the fact that almost everybody, I mean, when I said this to this big American audience, and I said, this is our children we're talking about. Democrat, Republican, I couldn't care less. It's the future of our children. Is there a politician in the land who said, I don't care about our children? And a voice called out, you'd be surprised. But, well, I think most people care about children. And it is a way of getting in there. And I think what we've heard today is that we need action at different levels. 
I've been arguing, and it sounds a bit academic and abstract and abstruse, that health and health inequalities tell us a great deal about the nature of society. I knew that things were bad in the former Soviet Union and the communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe because health failed to improve. When the Soviet Union collapsed, things got worse in Russia. The society wasn't working. It got better in the Czech Republic and Poland and some of the other countries. So health tells us a great deal about how well the societies are functioning. And health inequalities tells us something even more. Now, trying to get that argument through to the decision makers sounds a little bit airy-fairy. But saying Scotland's doing well, but it could do better, and then translating it into some things they really do care about. And we said in the discussion, CMO, this afternoon, I said if you look at the gradient, for example, in school performance, the gradient by degrees of deprivation and affluence, and ask, aren't we failing our children? In England, only 30% in the most deprived deciles get as many as five Cs at the GCSEs, age 15. And any expert I've spoken to thinks that means children are not living up to their potential. And we potentially are giving politicians the opportunity to take action, to help all our children achieve their potential. And that means doing what we can to avoid adverse child experiences, doing what we can to understand resilience, um, promote recovery, doing what we can to improve early child development in general, not just avoid adverse child experiences. So we need specific action, and we heard a lot about that today, and we need to be addressing the nature of society. Next steps? Well, next steps are saying we've heard a great deal of interesting material. Mark Bellis in Wales gave us a 10-step plan of action at different levels. I said, Mark, we're going to be watching. We want to know if any of it works. We heard about action, excuse me, we heard about action at the very local and specific level, working with individuals. And we need it at all levels. So we need to get really active to build on the excellent material we've heard today and have an evaluative framework. I was saying at lunch, as somebody said to me, if you've never been proved wrong, you're not doing your job properly. So we need to have a self-critical, self-questioning, evaluative framework as we go forward, because we might be wasting time. Uh, I don't think we're wasting time in recognizing the dramatic importance of adverse child experiences, but we might be wasting time if we're doing things that are not effective in trying to address the problem. So continuing the work, but doing it in a context of evaluation, of knowing how well we're doing, I think is absolutely crucial. And you can see the potential benefits. Somebody said, I think it was Michael, um, I showed the US figures, and you talked about the Glasgow effect. Uh, the, it's interesting, the, the, uh, the point that Michael made, those excess causes of death that I showed on the US figures are exactly the same as the excess in Glasgow. They're all psychosocial, poisonings, suicide, alcohol-related deaths and other violent deaths. They're all psychosocial, and they all have their origin early in life. The goal is certainly one worth attaining, 
to improve health for everybody and reduce inequalities, to create societies where everyone can achieve their potential. And I go away from today hugely encouraged, and I want to thank you for that. And thanks to everybody for coming and for organizing such a splendid meeting.